Good morning to our doctors should say happy Easter this Sunday morning, April 4th, 2021 to our very, very tight knit data minded community and policy makers. Let us begin with follow as promised. We are going to look at the first article of why sudden death is occurring in individuals who are training with either an N95 mask or a surgical mask. This research was originally revealed in October 2020. It was revised, then accepted, and then publicly made available as late March. Also, too, as far as the data analytic aspect, we are going to tear apart the folly in reference to reproduction rate. How reproduction rate has been utilized as a pandemic mitigation guidepost in locking down entire countries. Yet, as you can see right here, the correlation to anything is relatively weak. Yeah, but we're going to tear that apart in a little bit, just like we tore apart the um, testing procedures into the antigen test uh, with asymptomatic individuals last week by running the confusion matrix. But let us begin as follows, and let's get into the research as follows. Here we go. I'm going to give this one a little bit more detail, and I'm going to primarily narrate through it. Due to the primary reason, again, you're going to see cardiac arrhythmias and spontaneous pneumothorax. This is an important one, and so I want to read a little slower as well, too, and it's going to eat up a little bit of time, but let us begin. It's important. When students return to school, unfortunately, some tragic events have been reported in China over the past few months. Several students without, repeat, without, Documented cardiac issues experienced sudden death when they were running in physical training classes with surgical masks or N95 respirators. Now, you think about the sensationalism of this particular article for its media value, yet through selection bias was never really made publicly available to the public. So let us get into the reason why the hypothesis of the conjecture into the research itself. And this is going to counter a lot of the media claims that masks do not make a difference in reference to physical exertion and training. Now, when you weed through that research and you look at the test subjects, often what they consider exertion is walking briskly on a treadmill, uh, which is not real world scenarios. You and I both recognize a lot of the mask hypothesis work very well in a lab setting, but real world settings, obviously like with the Den mask study we showed, there was no statistical significance for a mask in public whatsoever. Yet, how, however, it became a political issue more than so a um, actual scientific issue. So let us proceed. What are the reasons why? There are still potential harmful side effects of wearing masks or respirators when running and exercising outdoors. Face masks and respirators lead. Let's make this a little larger for our audience here. Uh, some said... Uh, Face mask respirator lead to less air being inhaled and subsequent breathlessness. Some studies show increases of 120% in inspiratory and expiratory flow resistance when N95 respirators are used and the air exchange volume was reduced by an average of more than 30%. This is where the media really uh, began to fall apart uh, because of the selection bias utilized in the promotion of mask use uh, for whatever reason, they advertised falsely uh, their claim that it did not make a difference by using, utilizing individual cases as opposed to actually revealing uh, real studies. Per se, the Denmas study, which we mentioned before, where there was no statistical significance. And this started in the very beginning. But I digress. Let us proceed. The mean carbon dioxide levels rise. And remember, we hear a lot of that in the media where they claim, I should say, popular belief. Uh, where that does not happen. Obviously, that, that is not the case. The mean carbon dioxide levels rise, the mean oxygen levels drop in the breathing space inside face masks and respirators. This is an important aspect right here. And this is well footnoted. And the links will be there for you to follow too. Furthermore, the exhaled carbon the exhaled, ex exhaled, please forgive me, carbon dioxide can accumulate and can subsequently be inhaled during each respiratory cycle. This increases the frequency and depth of breathing, leading to oxygen deficiency, hypoventilation, and hypoxemia. This process contributes to glucose breakdown. Here we go. In a dangerous rise in lactic acid levels, predisposing individuals, especially runners, uh, especially runners breathing at a higher rate and needing much more air to a higher risk of sudden death. 
Again, predisposing individuals, especially runners, breathing at a higher rate and needing much more air to a high risk of sudden death. Vital information, especially with high school students, students returning back to school, which are being required to wear a facial mask while exerting themselves physically, although be it at a very low risk of any sort of uh, COVID complications, per se. I'm not saying they can't catch the disease, but most cases with uh, children, they tend to basically ward it off pretty effectively with the low relative risk ratio. The interaction between respiration and heart rate variability induces respiratory sinus arrhythmia, which has been used to evaluate the function of the vagus nerve and can affect the prognosis of the cardiovascular system. Although experts argue such extreme symptoms are likely for most people, however, in subsets of individuals with underlying cardiovascular and respiratory disease or with particular tight-fitted masks or with particular tight-fitted masks and respirators. So I'm not certain whether researchers here are trying to correlate the direction between a loose-fitting mask and people with cardiac uh, comorbidities, i.e., or having the same effect with individuals with tight-fitted mask or respirators. Maybe exacerbated their exercise, such as running. In a study of more than 200 paramedics, approximately 30% reported experiencing headaches when they wore face masks or respirators. And then it goes into the temperature, humidity, circulatory systems, discomfort. It goes on to the entire line. There's no conflict of interest, and the article itself is well footnoted. I will have a link for you to follow accordingly. But yet, very vital. It's just scratching the surface. It needs to be in research a little bit more. But between you and I and policy decisions, if the risk is greater than the benefit, that is a decision that rests on your conscience, not mine. Let us proceed as follows to the next one. Remember in the beginning of the pandemic, where they were basically saying, let's make this a little larger if we can, where they were basically saying that generally that sunlight may make a difference in the deactivation of the SARS-CoV-2. And then it began to go more towards UVC light, which is the 254 nanometer or 232 nanometer spectrum, which made sense. But then it just fell apart, primarily because the research that was done in the beginning may have been incorrect. So I want to highlight the research right here, a second look at sunlight. Researchers are urge a closer examination of sunlight's efficacy in inactivating the SARS-CoV-2 virus. According to the letter, the experiments demonstrated virus inactivation times of about 10 to 20 minutes being in the sunlight, much faster than predicted by theory. Another policy decision in reference to pandemic mitigation strategy, which is vital. When you lock people in their homes in areas where the ventilation is poor, a substandard, and you know basically that was done in many states, in many countries, and yet sunlight is probably one of the best outside of even the vitamin D production, which was shown that individuals in, in their very beginning in Lombardy, Italy, were so vitamin D deficient that were succumbing to COVID-19. Uh, that they were on the verge of having rickets. But to proceed here, now you draw the correlation. So you can't lock people in their homes and expect everything to be better. But here, if they could have been outdoors, we could have had a much different story. The theory predicts that inactivation should happen in order of magnitude slower, in the experiment, quote the researcher. In the experiments, viruses and stimulated, simulated saliva and exposed to UVB lamps were inactivated more than eight times faster than would have been predicted by theory, while those cultured in a complete growth medium before exposure to UVB were inactivated more than three times faster than expected. To make the math of the theory fit the data, according to the letter, SARS-CoV-2 would have to exceed the highest UVB sensitivity of any currently known virus. That means SARS-CoV-2 would have been the most sensitive virus that they've ever would have studied in reference to its vulnerability to sunlight. Now, here where they come the catalyst. The catalyst being between UVA and UVB. See, the thing is, everyone was myopically looking at just one spectrum of UV light, either UVC, UVB, or UVA. But what about if it was just natural sunlight, UVA and UVB together? Even though UVC, not as common, but UVA and UVB, yes. So what they basically are coming down to is they don't know. But bottom line is here. 
UVA could potentially be used far more broadly to augment air filtration systems at a relatively low risk for human health, suntan. Even though UVA, for example, you get a deeper tan, especially in higher risk settings such as hospital, public transportation, but the specifics of each setting warrant consideration. So they discovered that basically that UVA, what they thought may not have much of an effect, but in combination with the UVB, IB natural sunlight, something happened which basically blew the prior theories away. Those reactive intermediate molecules in turn can be interacting with the virus, hastening inactivation. It is a concept familiar to those who work in wastewater treatment and other environmental science fields. So yes, they got to look at sunlight again. And the hypothesis, the gut emotion of everybody in the beginning, remember February, March, April, they're all saying sunlight deactivates it, may have been correct in ways that may have been different than they expected. But in the natural setting with UVA and UVB, it needs to be re-examined. Next, schools. All right, this is an interesting aspect too with the schools itself as far as schools reopening. Now, this is a basically a study insights from two reopened schools during the COVID-19 pandemic. A lot of other countries never shut down the schools. But here in the United States, and I'm going to step aside on this one because it's a policy decision, which obviously it, I am not going to go one way or the other. But the facts, here we are. Throughout the semester, both schools saw cases, but the rate of transmission was 0.5 or lower. This is important because we are going to go into the reproduction factor in the, in the data aspect coming up. Because each infection causes less than one additional infection on average. An infection doesn't spread much within a school. Quoting the author, says, blah, 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 blah. quote, if we can get a rate of 0.5 in the community, that would be amazing. We'd be rid of COVID already. So looking at that reproduction factor of a 0.5. So the, the irony is here is basically that having the schools open for whatever reason, social distancing, masking, whatever it comes down to be, actually reduced, uh, re resulted in a cascade effect of reducing the spread of infection, it appears, to some aspect without adding publisher bias. You know, they're saying mask wearing, social distancing, and so, so forth, because they did have uh, transmission, uh, where it was rare, but it was associated with non-mask wearing outside the school itself. That's a hypothesis per se. But they believe, for example, on this case, schools reopening, A, to what they're claiming, what they're trying to encourage, um, you know, more contagious variants coming around. Well, again, that's weaponizing uncertainty and anything can happen. Hang on one second, right back. And so it proceeds. So you get an idea. A 0.5 reproduction rate, I assume that's what we're talking about, is just amazing. And they said we'd be over it already. Now, whether that's exp herd exposure, you know, whatever it comes down to be, you know, they're just saying, hey, this is the facts, this is the data, this is what they observed. All right, so let's get right into the next aspect, which is why. T cell immunity could be the king of basically helping with mitigating any sort of pandemic infection, especially with new strains coming out there. This was kind of really cool. Now, it's a little detailed, but still, you get the gist. In the study of recovered COVID 19 patients, the researchers determined that SARS CoV 2 specific CD8 plus T cell responses remain largely intact and could recognize, I am going to repeat this a couple of times, could recognize virtually all mutations in the variant study. While larger studies are needed, the researchers note that their findings suggest that the T cell response in convalescent individuals and most likely in vaccines are largely not affected by mutations found in these variants and should offer protection against emerging variants. So that's pretty much good news in reference to T cell. Uh, I would still be pressed to see the vaccinees, I like the name vaccinees, uh, in reference to basically how they would do it in the wild forms, especially B117 and B135 and so on and so forth. But you think about this one. It's, you know, coronavirus per se, it's really weird because you had the coronavirus one, 
SARS-CoV-1, remember, which really affected young children. And then a few years later, a decade later, or whatever it is, you have SARS-CoV-2, which goes the exact opposite, uh, which tends to affect, uh, how to say, elderly individuals. So you really wonder now if the people that were infected with SARS-CoV-1, those children, which would be adults today, would still have antibodies against uh, SARS-CoV-2. Now, that's really a weird contrast between COV-1 and COV-2. If you think about it, how do you go from one SARS-CoV-1 affecting uh, children, per se, as a majority of those which were hurt the most, to COV-2, which went to a totally different spectrum and started basically affecting elderly and not really affecting children at all. Isn't that weird when you think about it, a reference to mutation? Um, I know what you're thinking, uh, but however, though, again, that is a, a massive jump in how that works. But to proceed as follows. All right, new risk factors linked to increased risk of, co of COVID-19 infection. HDL cholesterol. Now, they go through the healthy weight of normal body mass, and this is probably a correlation. But what they found, uh, basically, uh, those that, did the uh, would not affected the worst is just to say we're associated with having a higher HDL. Uh, basically, British volunteers of the age of 40 researchers examined health factors those who tested positive for COVID-19 and compared them to those who tested negative. They found that those who had a positive COVID-19 test were more likely to be obese or have type 2 diabetes. Those who tested negative were more likely to have higher levels of good HDL as well as being healthy weight and normal body mass index. But it's really interesting because they began to key in on really HDL. So individuals who exercise more, diet rich in monosaturated fats, and it's kind of interesting how they recommend the foods as well. Uh, extra virgin olive oil and avocados may be helpful too. And that really opens up a door to future research. Would it be cool if just something as simple as that uh, and some effect of having HDL levels elevated by due to the greater consumption of virgin olive oil or avocados? So now you go back as an epidemiologist and you look at the dietary habits of those basically that were uh, testing negative, uh, even in the most intense situations. Be curious. All right, Dan, basically, all right, I think that was at it for the research, but let us proceed as follows. Oh, by the way, I want to make sure. Another thing too, often people will hear me refer to basically this 15 liters a minute and this one particular research that we covered a while ago, that generally that with the COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2, a lot of the hypothesis was based upon the micron level of it being based on saliva and so on and so forth and being airborne and aerosolized. But however, though, the concern was this. If it was submicronized, which has now been shown to be, you have run a higher risk of nose deposition. Remember, this is a lab setting to be fair. So I have to make sure it's not real world. Uh, but this hypothesis is important because the reason being, we're seeing people sit in a car with their face coverings on. And if they were out or whatever it is and so on and so forth, you get the gist, you're really beginning to restrict this airflow here. And if that airflow has been restricted and SARS-CoV-2 is still infectious at the three micron level or above, nose deposition right there. And you see the whole thing. And there I go talking. Ah. See? And we covered that back on December 20th, 2020. And we got 187 views so far. That's pretty good. Usually beats our 70. All right, now we're going to cover the reproduction rate. And for those not familiar with reproduction, here we go. 
I don't know why the BBC did it this way. A coronavirus patient would naturally infect three others on average, but if a vaccine could protect two of them, see how they're kind of creating an internal bias or subconscious bias, uh, of them from infection, then the reproduction number would fall from three to one. Of course, vaccines have been shown to reduce the severity of the coronavirus, but no one's saying that the vaccine itself is reducing transmission effectively at that rate. But you see, that I don't know where they also get uh, an R factor, of a reproduction rate of three, because the main reason is this. Let us begin with that analysis. Da, da, da. There's an antigen test thing, and, but this today, that was so last week. Here we go. And this is what we're going to do. We're going to break it down. So the reproduction re- factor, what is the reproduction rate? And if we look at this in this heat map, do, 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 you want to look for either negative 0.7 or 0.7, some sort of strong correlation, and you're not going to find it except with itself. Ba-ba, right there. And here's a reproduction rate in the very beginning. Looking at April, I should make this a little bigger, but now nah, we'll work with what we got. April to April. Do, 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 do. And it seems like the reproduction rate, this is the United States, went pretty low. And then the vaccine started coming out, and ironically, for whatever reason, correlated the reproduction rate seemed to go up. And so that's really weird. That's going to play an important role in our correlation. Remember, correlation is not causation. Being the vaccine's not causing it, proven to cause it, one way or the other. All right, but here we go. But look at this reproduction rate at the very beginning. The problem is this. The media is still fixated on that reproduction rate of being a three. Uh, but however, though, obviously... Not much has changed. So let's proceed as follows. This is just a basic correlation of anything above 0.5. And you see some trues, trues, and true. Yeah, you see it right there. I even shifted the data seven days both ways just for fun. Uh, I really see much of a correlation. And here we are. First one we're doing is Kendall Tau. Because I want to be fair, I don't run through all three uh, hypotheses, so to say. What this red line represents is 70. And 70 means correlation normally, or you could, you could have a chance of a strong causative relationship. And here we are. You're not seeing any correlation with anything with this reproduction rate when it comes to Kendall Tau, uh, except with itself. And Kendall Tau is usually, usually utilized most often when you don't have a lot of data to work with. All right, so I just wanted to do that one, it's just for fun. So, but here we go to Pearson. <laughs> Here's an interesting thing. The reproduction rate, right here, is correlated with people being fully vaccinated and people being fully vaccinated per 100, which makes sense, as opposed to almost being negatively correlated with the index in reference to Pearson. So is it... Reproduction rate correlated to total deaths, new deaths, new deaths smooth, do, 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 do. not much. And the reason that's important is because your country's leaders, in this case, when you're creating states of emergency and, and reducing inalienable rights or civil liberties, we'll just call them your feudal lords, uh, basically are using the reproduction rate as a pandemic mitigation measure to guide as a guidepost to locking things down and not seeing much of a correlation. Now, there can become conf- conflation. And again, there needs to be weeded through a lot better than this particular model here because this is a very generalized model. So I want to, but however, though, still, if you can prove a greater correlation of reproduction rate having anything to do, just like the masks, numerically, with basically reduction of viral loads and so on and so forth, not in a lab setting and then being hypothesized and conjectured upon a larger thing. That's why I can't stand about the mask. The only real world double blind study real was the Den mask study and they totally ignored it. And it was a wonderfully beautifully done study and they basically crucified the researchers. Not good for science, but to proceed. And let's do this spearman. Da 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 right there and there is a reproduction rate. So again Knock it, dislike the video, whatever it is, perfectly fine. Show me a correlation. That's what it is. I would like to learn. Show me what is being done wrong in reference to this, the correlation and the math not panning out in reference to reproduction rate. 
We all can learn. And I would love to learn. And that's what I want to do. I want to learn. Show me how the reproduction rate is actually a good guidepost in reference to or how it has been over the past year now that we've accumulated significant data in reference to certain countries and controls and mitigation strategies being loose or tight. All you got to do. And guess what we're bringing back to just for interest uh, again. Remember, though, this is the Monte Carlo prediction. Monte Carlo is something we usually, usually, usually utilize in order to unfairly uh, gauge future stock prices, uh, which other individuals are not fully aware of. But however, though, Monte Carlo is a wonderful machine learning model that's fairly basic and gives you an idea of where you're heading. So what we're working here is from January 1st, 2021. These are new deaths current USA. You notice how it's beginning to drop down below fairly effectively, which I'm grateful. Uh, this is the accumulation factor. We're doing 100 iterations uh, starting. This is 4.4. Yes, that is today. And that's its predicted model at the current rate. And it could take any one of these paths. New cases per million prediction. And that's total. It's like because you can't go backwards. So you know this is not like on a daily basis. This is it's over time. So the Monte Carlo model utilizing the information available uh, would have said there'd be, I don't think it would be, but according to the data, by April 18th, you'd be hitting close to 600,000 or 575,000 for those not familiar. So this is the predicted course as time proceeds forward. Uh, new cases per million, though. Here we go. Uh, right here. Taking a lot of paths. Now, last time we did this back in June, it took the wild outlier path. So be cognizant of that. But however, though, if we follow the majority of the path, or basically the mean, we're looking probably right around doo -doo -doo, right around below 75 cases per million. Now it's not deaths, that's cases per million. New deaths per million, prediction with using Monte Carlo method. All right, there's a standard deviation, a mean, so on and so forth. Starting from April 4th, it looks like there's a small chance of it's staying about high up to June 6, 2021. But if we follow the mean, basically, well, visually, I should say, right down the line, looking about one death per million uh, by around July 5th. Let's see if Monte Carlo machine, uh, Monte Carlo method, which is really basic. Not, I don't want to say basic math because I want to be demeaning, but here is the formula right there. If you want to look at it, it you know as far as how it works, basic, simple, predictable. No pun intended. All right, world audit. Let's go this way. All right, here we go. I'm going to move real fast here. I'm going to try to get this down as fast as possible. What do we have here? I should have started towards the top. New cases smooth per million. Uh, you see the cases there going up there. And then basically this is the world as a whole. And then now right there, you see it begins to drop. Now new deaths smooth per million right down there. And let's just do some, something real fast. I want to take the uh, look at the data. And I just want to see what we're missing here because I want to get the number for us. So this is global. New death smooth per million. And we are looking right there about 1.25. So if we break that down, let's say, for example, like this on, let's see. Let's see, we just break, break down this one size. Trying to remember this one here. All right, there's our graph right there. And so we're going right about there. And remember, this is basically when the pandemic began. And you really got to count it right about here when testing started to kick in. So if you break it down, right about there is a pretty nice drop, which brings us right about to this hot spot we had right before October. So that just gives you an idea uh, where we're at. But to proceed as follows, let's look at the other, let's look at the other areas. And plus, again, I want to just show you a little bit of Python and Python biostatistics as far as breaking it down. It's actually one of my favorite favorite uh, statistical analysis uh, languages, higher languages. 
And so new cases moved per million. Sweden all of a sudden had a drop right there. Now that doesn't tell you the whole story. Yes, Sweden popped up above it and did start incorporating the masks, but the mortality rate, that's where the bread and butter is for us. Counting cases is, is one thing, but hospitalizations or how sick it makes people, you know, you start counting the common cold, and I'm not drawing a correlation, but you get the picture. Uh, rapid drop, right in the right area there. Cases to positive rate. Cool. Now, here we go. Uh, do, 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 USA, nice drop. Uh, positive drop. Deaths per million. Now, we're going to move a little forward here. Uh, look at our Asian friends. And it literally, literally, and again, I say this every single video, uh, amazing. Our Asia friends really have came through this unscathed. To proceed forward, and here we are. Look at this. New death smooth per million Sweden. All right, this is comparing apples to apples. The infectious rate went above what the United States was as we looked at it. But look at the look at the mortality rate, 1.358 compared to 2.532. Even though they had a higher infectious rate than the United States did, look at that. And their pandemic mitigation strategy is still pretty loose. All right, here we go. Da da da. United States versus all of Asia. Let's look at what we have here as a comparison. There's a mortality, including India again. That Ganji River thing, the religious festivals, people thought the world was going to come to an end. It did not. Uh, it just goes to predictive models or reference to a lot. A lot of these researchers are, I, I take that back, they're not using models. Or if they use the models, there's a heck of a lot of bias being incorporated into the models because the data which we have available, you and I read on a regular basis, is not how we describe it. Are we looking at it wrong? Is it looking at it different? Because they've been wrong around every single curve that they basically predicted was around the other side. They've been consistently wrong. And yeah, eventually if you keep on having a 100 question test per se, and you keep on saying false every question, eventually you'll get one or two right. But you can't use those outliers as an excuse for being knowledgeable. If you're still scoring an F, you're still getting an F. Yeah, you may have one or two right. But no, we want... We want people or leaders that are getting more of a B or an A. You know what I mean? Uh, let's proceed forward. Mortality rate. Asia, 4,463,000,000 individuals. Asia, more total mortality is 432,113. I'm right here. U.S. Population, 329,000,000 million, approximately. U.S. total mortality is 554,779. Notice how that slowed. Look at that comparison. U.S. mortality, remember, one per every 593 individuals. Asia, one per every 10,328. Epidemiologists have to stop go playing the political line and the political uh, mouthpieces out there echoing what they believe their employer wants them to say and start actually being a little brave and coming out and saying, hey, yes, we need to protect ourselves again against pandemics, but you know, let's take a second look at this as far as severity and what we've done as far as create collateral damage in, in trying to fight this pandemic. We'll use it that way. Or as our leader said, kill the virus, which we all know that's it's like, huh? All right, so until the virus is gone. It's like, yeah, that's like that. Like that's something. All right, here we go. Da da da. We keep it going. Correlation. People fully vaccinated. Da da da. Mortality percentages. We looked at that. Da da da. Scrolling down, scrolling down. Interesting. Mortality percentage. Look at that. Compare it to basically new cases per million. Uh, there is that. There is that. There is that. The theoretical quantiles. I keep on bringing that up. Fitted values. Residuals. Residuals. Uh, yeah. Look like we're getting closer. All right. New deaths cases per million worldwide. Now, this is interesting. Look at this. All right. Here we go. New cases and new deaths. This is a little perplexing to I. So if you look at right here, you look at Brown and South America. Right there, right? The new cases have not raised, raised have not risen that much. In fact, the new cases, if you could read a little bit below the line, the shade there is pretty similar to North America. But look at the deaths. What the freaking heck? That is perplexing because the deaths are way outpacing the cases. New variant, you may say, who knows, but whatever it is, 
Uh, keep an eye on that. Let's proceed forward. Do, do, do. Asia, look at the new cases smoothed. Africa, not really affected that much. Europe, a little bit of a rise, not as much as Asia. Remember that you have to put it in perspective as far as looking at the y-axis. And so North America, a little bit low. I mean, I, I don't really go by cases anymore. I'm not just saying that, you know, make it sound good. But, you know, because as the, the virus, most viruses tend to shift or drift, the twin area will become um, more transmissible but less lethal. You know what I mean? That seems to be the natural evolution of most viruses, uh, especially the coronavirus class. Uh, new cases smooth. Again, look at that. Africa, not so much. Europe, eh, bounce. North America, still a little low. Oceania, that's 300. Again, pay attention to the y-axis. Let's go look at this. Uh, new cases overall. Pretty sharp spike. Now, look at the time here. March 15th to April 1st. And no, that makes everybody sweat. But again, you got to look at the mortality and the hospitalizations. And so we look at that. Uh, new cases overall. New deaths. 400 of as of April 1st. Compared to Africa, compared to Europe. Now remember, their 400 right there is the average for Europe with a greater population base. Look at our North America, which is still, we're higher than everyone else at about 900. Now, South America, again, it's a little, it's a little perplexing. Three for Oceania. Proceed. New deaths share on the y axis. Let's put it all in perspective. There's Asia. There is basically North America. There is South America. South America it makes me really weird. It's just it's an unusual climb, but it's not going anywhere else. And I'm looking at deaths. I'm not referring to cases. I'm referring to deaths. And so deaths per million. Da, 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 da. Nothing much. Nothing much. There's South America. And this just gives you the idea of Europe because we're locking all Europe down. This kind of fuzzy as far as looking at that. We'll clear that up next time. All right, other correlations? Let's look here. Do, do, do. do we have any correlations out here? Age, mortality, so on and so forth. Doesn't appear to be any. Um, again, the female smoker. Now, this is something that's to be revisited too. Remember how they look at the daylight? Now, the problem is what the researchers did. Is the researchers, what they did is they looked, you know, because in the beginning we we're trying to figure out why smokers were having a higher uh, survival rate in reference to COVID than non smokers. It makes no sense. It could damage the lungs. Well, that was the problem. Looking at the smokers. Now, what does cigarette smoke consist of, especially in the United States, especially if they're utilizing radon based pesticides? Polonium, lead, cadmium, arsenic. A lot of those elements in the smoke, the cigarette smoke itself, are so freaking toxic that they have, they have to have some effect in breaking down a virus or, or inactivating it, albeit not at the benefit of the uh, smoker itself in the long run. But you consider, for example, when I think it was UC San Diego found that lead 210 was heavy in the cigarettes, which they decided not to take out because it gave individuals a sense of um, a faster rush to leave those radioactive elements in the cigarettes itself. Um, you know, radiation, we use it to, you know, disinfect a lot of stuff. So adding radiation, radiation to cigarette smoke, you would not think would have the exact same effect on potentially anything else. But let us proceed as follows. USA, mortality rates out to 2.532, as we covered before. And we're moving up the scale uh, as far as beneficial to individuals. World Mask, Oxford University, please update the data and reference the masks. We know this is not cor correct, so let's proceed forward. Uh, that's basically deaths per million. Let's look at some of the individual countries. Sweden, down below, again, dropping quite rapidly. I'm just interested to see if they're going to drop the mask recommendation because they're at level two. Uh, case per million just started to drop. Boom, plummeted. Again, can't figure it out. Brazil, here we are. Deaths per million. That seems to be the hot spot we're looking at. Mass, do you think it makes a difference? Again, correlation, I don't know. Uh, but here we are. 
I don't know what tech that is, data from reporting wise. Japan, Asian friends, not really that affected. New Zealand, Oceania, not that effective. Da da da, da da. Finland, seems to be dropping again. India, not that affected. Again, it's it's you have to find. It's not the fact is pointing out like saying, see, look, here's Spain. They have more cases and they wear masks. That's that's not necessarily the case, or they don't wear masks. The trick is we're trying to find out with the controls, with different mitigation strategies of each country, what does work and what doesn't work. And otherwise, you know, you think about it, if you utilize masks too long, you are going to create an atmosphere of dysbiosis. Uh, we're going to end up changing the microbiome to its detriment. Or you're going to hand sanitize yourself out of um, existence, so to say, because you can't uh, sterilize your society. And that's kind of what we're trying to do. Between distancing and sterilization, you know, that's not exactly not mean sterilization as far as you know what I mean, sterilization. But yeah, you mess with the microbiome enough, and yeah, that's going to be the outcome that was implied. Sterilization, sterilization. Uh, it'd be interesting to see a society which reduces its uh, natural microbiome down by 50% and see what happens. United Kingdom, did they do? I mean, we already have, again, we reported before, most common uh, bacteria in infants is now lo- no longer found. Infantitis, uh, bifidobacterium infantitis is no longer there. And there's Despermillion, uh, United Kingdom. This is an interesting look. They're almost like, wow, that's amazing. And there it is. And their mask level is at a three, not a four. Um, I like this little separation. It always makes me feel better when I see tests and cases drop dramatically. Italy, they're talking about the fourth wave or fourth lockdown. I don't know if that's for sensationalism or not. But if these if this, these states and countries are really being locked down that heavily, then why when's it gonna start working? All right, so let's begin. Let's go population again, hospital occupancy. I'll show you a quick run through that real fast. Uh, these are the the states we said we're gonna fall apart. Green is your co uh, your inpatient beds used by COVID patients. Uh, again, uh, I don't know. Who's doing the predicting, saying these states are going to fall apart and have massive infections and motorcycle rallies and spring breaks and 4th of July and family gatherings? The data does not support the accusation. And it needs to be – it's like shouting fire at a movie theater. If they continue to keep on doing it, uh, they really need to be uh, find another job. All right. Let's see what this one is. Vaccine administration, the population. All right. There we are. Uh, if things are perfect, I did not include the Johnson and Johnson one and AstraZeneca one because of the bad batch uh, situation, which we're familiar with. If everything was done perfectly, that would be the percentage of your population. I know it's tough to read. Uh, that would be fully vaccinated by the second dose. All right, that's hospitalization. We're going to pass over that because that has not been updated. If the vaccine delivery is perfect by April 4th, that is the percentage of the population that should be fully vaccinated with two doses using the MR, mRNAs uh, uh, vaccines. All right, so let's proceed forward uh, to dot to a rebuild. And this should really reveal some interesting information. So let's go not too far. And let's go. Let's da, 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 merging data frames, merging data frames, merging data frames, merging, merging, merging. Hospitalized patients with COVID, the total of patient beds. Remember, it's, you know what it is? It's Easter. You know what they remind me of? Remember last year, they said this would all be over by Easter 2020. Again, another horrible miscalculation by our feudal lords. Hospital patients with COVID, the total of patient beds. Do-do-do. There it is. And that starts from May. And there it goes. And these are all the states. I mean, it looks pretty, you know, mind numbing I mean, because it all looks pretty similar. Um, you know, it's just like, yeah. But I, again, I wanted to print the data out accordingly, especially as COVID tracking uh, went down as far as one of the data analytic aspects. Uh, so I'm using our world in data from Oxford University. Just get an idea. These are our loose states. Loose states as meaning loose restrictions or dropped out of the mask restrictions. I use the mask as my own personal stringency index since the mask really is the hot potato of the whole element. 
And so these are the states I just added. Arkansas, Wisconsin. So let's see what we have here. New deaths per 100,000. No mask loose restriction states. And again, here's the thing with the testing. The antigen test is so inaccurate uh, in reference to false positives that I really want to start veering away from the antigen test as we found out last week that 72% of the asymptomatic individuals that end up testing positive don't have the virus, then us going by the infection rate is really superfluous. So let us proceed. You, you get what I mean. So I prefer to go by deaths and hospitalizations because that's the main aspect. That was the whole reason in the very beginning we wanted to, what we called, flatten the curve. So let's look at our curves. New deaths per 100,000, no mask, loose restriction states. The world was going to come to an end, but look at the patterns. They follow a very similar pattern. And the thing about it is, is this pattern is pretty much replicated even in the tight restriction states. So again, you're a researcher, you're a data analyst. You try to develop a machine model to find out what pandemic mitigation strategies work compared to your control states, which do nothing. Again, that's you build your machine learning model. Proceed. There, here we are. Do, do, do. do you see any, um, do you see Virginia there? Do you see any place where the world is coming to an end? Not really. Arkansas, I think, ended yours on April 1st, was it? Yeah. So just pretty recent, but I added it to the thing anyways. Tight restriction states. Do, do, do. Let's see. These are the mask people. I don't want to make it sound condescending. And there we are. And so similar patterns to some aspect. But you know the weird part about it? Check this out. Uh, is in the areas where you have these loose restriction states, what are you noticing between May and November? at a consistent pattern in most cases of your loose restriction states that happens in your tight restriction states. You see? Often a lot of these states will have this spike right there, right there, right there, and right there, right there, which you don't really see as a common pattern in your loose restriction states. Food for thought. All right, let's proceed. And here we are. Do, do, do. All right, let's just go in there. Torn metallic, I'm just going down here. New cases per 100,000, smooth, tight restriction states. Da, da, da. Pretty. This is the reporting. What I'd use this for right here. And you see these outliers right there? This is your, you know, your bar whisker, meaning 50% of your data should be here. And so, you know, you see these outliers. It's usually indicating at one point in time there may have been data dumping. It just it creates an air of suspicion. Where certain areas, for example, like Hawaii here, you don't see this massive line you know, up there. Uh, but again, this could also be too, you have a very small population and you never know, but proceed. Or it could mean you have pretty standard reporting, especially if you not have much variation and that can bring a rise of suspicion as well. Right, so here we go, this red line, uh, right here is basically going to give you your your, um, your mean. This is the average. So the first one here, let's go with here. Doo -doo -doo. I'll tell you what that is in a second. All right, so this is loose restriction states. The cases per 100,000, let's cross, cross over the, the cases. Uh, but if you look right here, it could be from testing, not testing. I know there could be a lot of conflation and confounding, da da da, whatever t terminology you want to use. But look. So right there, let's, let's magnify that to, I think, March, do, 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 right around there. And so look at this. This is your cases, per 100,000. But let us, and this is where April begins. So let us begin, but you see the debt's rolling seven. There's your data if you want to go by cases. Then your no mass states or your loose restriction states. There's your data. Again, there's your controls. Prove that your mitigation strategy, your pandemic mitigation strategies work. That's what you have to do. New case, per 100,000, rolling seven type. Here we are. Boom, boom, boom. Right as the mean. Now, look at this. This is a perfect example of how this can look deceiving. You see the height of the red bar? But you notice right there? The mean is 121. 
uh, cases per 100,000 between the tight restriction states. The mean here is 101 uh, cases per 100,000 in your loose restriction states. You see? It gives you, it, tell, it tells you. But if you look at the, gra the data offhand, this looks smaller, which it is, than this. But however, though, visually it's deceiving. Numerically, it's enlightening. Here we are. Do, 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 do. And we are now looking at deaths per 100,000, smoothed. Pretty similar. Again, you're the data analyst. You have to determine, see here, remember we talked about the second thing, that the loose restriction states don't. Is that a bias information? Is that them sending people to long-term care facilities, which should not be there? Because if you really want to create a virus to spread, you take the individuals which are sick or ill, especially when you have all these tents and tent cities built up all over the place and these hospital ships here and there. But no, you take your basically your most vulnerable individuals. Instead of sending them to these multiple facilities you have built everywhere uh, that could basically shield them and protect them and get good, uh, good, good health care, no, we'll take the sick individuals and send them to areas where the individuals are the most vulnerable, which most likely will create a vector for viral propagation in a virus that should not be spreading. That was a major difference between us and our Asian friends, is they actually built facilities and sent the in individuals and kept them separated from other individuals who were more vulnerable. We, and of course, for whatever reasons, unbeknownst to I, did not. Proceed forward. Do, do, do. There's a median. There's a median. Uh, deaths per 100,000, rolling seven. Pretty similar. Uh, again, towards the beginning of March t today. Uh, looking at the graphs, da, 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 da. deaths per 100,000, green states versus white states, deaths per 100, rolling seven. This is uh, looking at the whole picture from May to April of last year. Getting pretty close again. Looking at that again, here is our tight restriction states. Here's your tight restriction bounce. What the heck is going on in Vermont? Uh, you see that right there? Let's go look in New York, Minnesota, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Connecticut. Your tight restriction states, they seem to bottom out. New Jersey, District of Columbia. Look at our, our loose restriction states. Tire restriction states, could that be the result of a year's worth of dysbiosis? You see all of it again rising up. Loose restriction states. There's an Iowa, maybe. North Dakota. You got a little West Virginia there. But maybe a little bit of Alaska. Maybe a turn of Florida. But what? A, but overall... It's like, wow, the, the tire restriction states, again, for whatever reason, uh, seem to be either flatlined or balanced, bad terminology, please forgive me, but flatlined graphically, uh, basically, or bouncing up, where your loose restriction states seem to be wanting it to go away, and for whatever reason, seem to be fairly effective, except maybe West Virginia. Again, that's data as is. You don't get the chance to see in, whoop, what's here? Oh, new case per 100,000. This is the recent. Loose states, except for North Dakota, ba ba bump. And tight states. What the heck is going on in Vermont? And Hawaii. And Minnesota. South Dakota. I don't know why I have that in tight still. Look at this. Look at Michigan. What the heck is that? Connecticut? Let's put it this way. All right. Here you are. You're in, an alien from another planet. And you want to go visit a state. You have two choices. You can visit a state within the tight restriction category after reviewing this data. Or you can go to a state that's in the loose restriction category. Your choice. Except maybe North Dakota there, which bounced up a little bit. But again, let's review the data as follows. And we covered all that. And we're covered. let's look at what we covered. Boom, boom, boom. All right. We covered the running with face mask respirators to get a wonderful analysis of why 
the face masks do do damage in reference to individuals trying to uh, exercise young individuals with normal exertion in a normal physical activity setting, not elderly walking brisk on a treadmill. So it's in the right arena and it's showing how basically certain individuals, unfortunately, have succumbed to basically sudden death from wearing a mask, per se. Not conclusive, but still good hypothesis. Second look at sunlight, yes, it was said in the beginning, everyone made the claim, it was it was knocked off, saying, ah, that's conjecture, it's not right, da da da, let the data play a role. Well, data's coming in now, and they recognize the initial theories, as many theories in the beginning of the COVID pandemic, were not guided well. Inside of the schools, again, United States, 0.5% uh, transmission rate, 0.5%. What they said, basically, if you could have the same transmission rate in schools as you would the general public, COVID would be rid, gone already. T cells, yes, you could be a vaccinee or non vaccinee. Uh, but exposure, it, once you're exposed to it, for whatever reason, your T cells, remember all the different types of variants. Good to know. All right, next, uh, HDL recommendations to raising HDL. Avocados, virgin olive oil, could be cool. All right, well, let's call that a night here. Again, the links will be there for you all to follow. And uh, again, thank you for listening. Once again, it is late. And if you're with me on this Easter uh, Sunday or just sometime during this week as we pass our 70 views, uh, again, I greatly appreciate it. This is actually quite enlightening um, in reference to policy decision makers and individuals with uh Data oriented mentality, uh, and of course, if you sign, if you if you are science minded, science in itself is an element of self doubt, and so it, we always are questioning ourselves. So even though the most scientific minds, which are constantly analyzing ourselves, looking at basically hypothesi, chances, probability as opposed to possibility, uh, you know, we're we're easy to basically to influence per se. You know, saying, hey, you know, is there a chance of this or that? And we're going to analyze that information for a long period of time. So, again, it's always good to say possible, probable, not possible, not probable, uh, as opposed to the bureaucrats who say the science is settled. Science is never settled. Again, gratitude. Thank you, Ralph, signing off. Look forward to you all next week, and I'll catch you next time. And happy, happy Easter. Catch you next time. Bye.